All right. So welcome, everyone. Before we get started, I want to just acknowledge uh, that I'm joining you today from the lands of the Wadjuk Noongar people. And I just want to pay respects to elders past and present from that country, but also acknowledge being a webinar, we may all be joining from different lands. So just want to again acknowledge, I guess, the great resilience of Aboriginal communities and acknowledge the elders from any of the countries which you may be joining from. So Wake Us Wednesdays at One is what we're hoping will be a free ongoing series of webinars uh, for around key issues and challenges and just issues of interest facing the community services sector in WA. In this first series, we're focused on inviting input and engagement from members and the broader sector around recovery planning. So as you all know, this idea of recovery from COVID-19 and what that looks like from a social and economic perspective. Um, we've done some initial thinking about that and so have some of our partners joining us today. And so really what we're focused on is getting your input and engagement on that to make sure that an inclusive plan for recovery is, is not leaving anyone behind. Each webinar has a presentation from Wacos, but also from some of our partners. Um, and then we have some opportunities for conversation and questions. So we'll be using the breakout room function a little bit later. So if you are able to just, you know, have your mic and video on at that point later in the webinar, um, that would be really great just to get that engagement and discussion. Uh, in terms of Zoom etiquette, if you can just remain on mute whilst we're in the kind of normal presentation format, um, the presenter view is the best one to use, but actually you're kind of forced into it when we're using the, the PowerPoint anyway. Um, and just being ready to participate in the small group conversations would be greatly appreciated. So for this session today on energy and conservation, we're joined by Michelle McKenzie, who's the CEO of Shelter WA, and also Chantal Caruso from Clean State, but also the Conservation Council of WA. Um, and we also have Wakeless's own Graham Hansen as well. So Graham's going to kick us off and we'll get straight into it. So Graham's going to talk to us a bit uh, generally about energy hardship and climate change vulnerability, especially uh, that facing low income households across the WA. So Graham, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks, Kylie, and thank you everyone for being on the webinar today. It probably goes without saying, but energy is an absolutely essential aspect of our lives. Anyone who's experienced a blackout can attest to how incredibly inconvenient it is to suddenly uh, be without power. Not only can you no longer watch TV or access the internet, uh, which is no minor thing when you're accessing services and information is increasingly only available online. You quickly realise you can't charge your phone, your fridge is no longer running, which becomes a more and more of a pressing issue the longer you are without power, and your ability to either cool or heat your home depending on the time of year is significantly curtailed as well. What might be a momentary inconvenience during a blackout can be a regular occurrence for people getting by on low income and experiencing energy hardship. We know that mounting unpaid bills and utility disconnections can have a significant impact on people's well-being. Impacts include feelings of shame, the stress of trying to stretch your income as far as possible, and the difficult decisions you have to make as to what to prioritise, such as not eating or not cooling your home during the heights of summer. These debts can also affect your ability to access affordable credit in future. This has a profound impact, not only financially, but also on people's health. Households living in poor quality housing with inefficient appliances have limited capacity to reduce their exposure to extreme heat, and older households may underestimate their vulnerability to adverse health outcomes. Next slide, please. Even though low-income households have been found to typically use less energy, the cost of energy disproportionately impacts them as they spend a much higher percentage of their disposable income on energy bills. Analysis ACOS and the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence conducted in 2018 has shown people on low income spend on average 6.4% of their income on energy compared to households in the highest income quintile who pay on average only 1.5%. Further, one in four low income households were found to be paying over 8.8% of their income on energy. Uh, next slide, please. Our analysis of Western Australian financial counselling data in our last cost of living report showed that those households seeking assistance were dedicating more of their expenditure towards covering utility costs than the average Australian household, 5% versus 4%. Households receiving financial counselling that were below the poverty line were dedicating 6.1% of their expenditure on utilities. It's worth noting that this comes at the expense of spending in areas like recreation, education, and health. Next slide, please. 
In recognition of this, one of the first financial support packages rolled out by the WA government during the COVID pandemic was around residential energy use. Back in March, which uh, feels like a lifetime ago now, the government uh, announced a boost to the energy assistance payment for concession card holders, which effectively doubled it. No interest was to be charged on deferred bill payments, and importantly, a moratorium was announced for energy disconnections and water restrictions. With so many households facing unemployment or reduced incomes, these measures were crucial to prevent them quite literally being plunged into darkness. With the moratorium due to end on September 30, however, the same time as we will see a decrease in JobKeeper and JobSeeker, we may soon see many households struggling to keep up with their energy bills and keep the power on. Uh, next slide, please. Having so much of their income dedica dedicated towards covering essential services like energy is part of what places people living in poverty at a greater risk from the impacts of climate change. They are also more likely to live in the most effective places and, and with less access to resources such as money, choice, power and social connections, their ability to cope, adapt or recover from the impacts of climate change are reduced. As noted by the fourth report of the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, Hardships from extreme events disproportionately affect those who are socially and economically disadvantaged. Research out of RMIT highlighted the significant dangers faced by at-risk households due to the increasing prevalence of extreme heat. 88% of survey respondents were aware of at-risk clients that did not use air conditioning during a heat wave and half were aware of clients also not using fans, with electricity costs the main reason. The majority of the respondents were aware of households experiencing adverse physical health impacts and or declining mental health as a result of restricting the use of fans or air conditioning in their homes. People living in poverty have been found to be more susceptible to the diseases that climate hazards can spread, as well as suffering more from the adverse effects of heat waves. As mentioned, they cannot afford amenities such as air conditioning. This greater susceptibility in turn undermines their income and asset position due to loss of productivity, employment and income, as well as leading to the development of chronic conditions resulting in general health and growth impacts. Next slide, please. I won't go into specific housing or broader climate related measures, but I would just highlight that providing low income households with the resources to become more energy efficient through home audits and appliance upgrades can have a significant impact. There are many programs in the eastern states that improve household e energy efficiency for those on low incomes. Western Australia, however, has not had a similar scheme in place since the axing of the Hardship Efficiency Program, HEP, in 2012. A revamped HEP should be introduced to support low-income households to access energy efficiency measures. WA also needs to shift to percentage-based concessions for energy and water, as are used in Victoria. As percentage-based concessions are calculated in proportion to usage, they ensure eligible households with higher essential energy needs receive more assistance in proportion to that need. This approach better supports individual households to cope with fluctuations in their energy consumption over time, as it can account for changes in household energy needs and seasonal variations. Finally, a properly managed transition to a clean economy is essential to benefit and protect low-income households and communities. It is critical that regulators and policymakers work together to ensure an affordable, inclusive and equitable transition that supports the workers and communities most affected. I'll leave it there and hand back to you, Kylie. Great, thanks Graham. Because we are a smaller group, I just wanted to invite you, if you've got a question for Graham, to just um, pop yourself off mute and ask. Nope. Alrighty. In which case, I will hand over to Michelle. So Michelle is the CEO of Shelter WA. Um, and Michelle is going to talk us through some energy efficiency measures or addressing energy efficiency measures across the housing continuum. Um, so Michelle, I'll pass over to you. Oh, thanks, Kylie. And I'm assuming you're the um, slide goddess. Fantastic. Um, so maybe we could slip this uh, skip this slide. Um, and for people that don't know um, who Shelter WA is, we're the peak body for social and affordable housing and ending homelessness. Pretty simple vision that all people living in WA have housing that enables them to thrive. And of course, 
picking up on what Graham said, you can't thrive if you're spending the majority of your low income on uh, inefficient energy use. The next slide, thanks Kylie. Just a quick thing about the housing continuum. So um, we need a, an effective housing system that provides really great housing at different price points across the market. And at the moment, um, if you're on a really great income, um, it's probably quite easier for you to uh, think about energy efficiency in your home. And our vision is that anyone, regardless of where they are in the housing continuum, has a great energy efficient home uh, that they can live in. So that's just uh, the housing continuum at the moment. Generally, people on lower incomes live in social housing or um, affordable housing, which is below market rent. A lot of people, a third of the market, actually rent their home um, through the private rental market. And many people, about a third of the population is all the way own or have a mortgage on their home. So we need to think about the whole housing continuum when we think about energy efficiency. Next slide, thanks Kylie. So I thought um, I'd just go through why we have an issue. Um, I won't read this slide, but um, as Graham said, housing remains the single, single largest cost for households in WA. If we think about our housing market, it's predominantly market-led and uh, the residential sector is dominated by owner occupation and the private rental market by small scale mum and dad investors. So one of the issues we've got is um, scalability. And so we need to, in terms of thinking about the issues, it's, it's very much dependent on the current housing market. Uh, if you think about a third of the homes in WA are rented either by public, through the public system or through social housing, it's interesting, generally the landlord is responsible for purchasing the energy efficient asset within the, the home, but the tenant pays the bill. So one of the things that we need to think about is um, who benefits and who pays if we think about energy efficiency. So we, we need to look at our regulatory environment, our investment environment, who benefits and who pays. Um, and you, you hear about um, this thing called a split incentive where the landlord who owns the home, what's in it for them if they're renting it in providing an energy efficient property because they don't actually uh, pay for the energy. Um, also, we've got a lot of people uh, living in multi-unit dwellings. So if you've got a, a lot of dwellings, who pays for the energy efficiency in the common grounds? And we've got new strata laws that fortunately make that easier. And um, many of you would know the Residential Tenancy Act is under review. We don't have any um, mandatory standards around energy efficiency that are really great from a tenant perspective. So we do have an issue. Next slide, Kylie, thanks. So if we do want to have an energy efficient housing system, you need to look across the whole system. Um, Graham's rightly focused on what can be done to empower consumers, but we actually need the right regulation so we've got the right homes, the design's right, the, the siting on the blocks right, uh, the density's right, and um, energy efficiencies right from the planning scheme master plans. Uh, we need the right incentives. We've got lots of homes out there that aren't energy efficient. How do we retrofit those? Um, how do we invest? Is it government grants? Do we get blended finance? Um, what role does industry have to pay? Um, as I said, the RTA is under review. So if we had some mandatory provisions, that could be a good thing in terms of minimum standards. And uh, there is some work going on through Development WA where they're looking at, um, I suppose, leading the, the property industry by doing some demonstration projects not just on an individual block, but on a um, on a like a master plan approach, and by doing those demonstration projects, they're de-risking um, the private sector in terms of showing this is how it can be done. These are the costs. These are the benefits. So government has a really great role in terms of uh, setting the lead for industry to follow. Next slide, thanks, Kylie. So we do have some things out there that we can build on. Um, there are, as Graham said, there were grants that don't exist anymore. There are some current federal and uh, state government grants, but we need to look at if, if this is the end game, what role is, it, is there for government and the private sector in terms of investing in this? Our planning reform is really, really important. We've got new design WA guide code, um, design codes. And if we have a good planning system, we can, plan out some of the energy efficiencies that are needed right from the master planning stage. Uh, we do have the COAG Energy Council. They've got a 10 year vision for energy. We just need to support that and make sure that it happens in terms of the national regulatory system. Um, also, we do have a NASA system, a National Home Energy Grading System. 
It's a star rating system, but the problem is at the moment, um, whilst it's administered by the Commonwealth, it's not mandatory. And um, only 20% of new homes in WA are certified through this, which means if you're purchasing a house or if you're renting a house, just like you get a fridge or a washing machine, there's no visibility around the energy efficiency of that home. Um, one of the key things at the moment is the National Construction Code. And uh, there's this new code, 2019, has some really much higher energy efficiency standards built into the building, into that code. Uh, the problem in WA is we've extended the transitional provisions of that code coming into effect to April next year, which means unlike the rest of Australia, any new builds between now and April don't need to uh, comply with higher energy requirements. I mentioned the review of the RTA, that's a real opportunity. Um, today I came from the launch of Build Buddy, that's a fantastic partnership with uh, the community sector, community housing providers, the financial counselling network, and um, homelessness service providers, where they've got an app in partnership with Climate Clever and they're piloting it over the next 12 months. So people in those homes can really understand their energy use, um, track it, monitor it, and modify um, and develop action plans to reduce their energy consumption. Great for the planet and great in terms of their bills. Uh, we're doing some work with um, blended finance that Kylie would know about. You know, how do we, um, at scale, make it much more efficient for asset owners like community housing providers to provide energy efficiency uh, for their tenants in terms of the built asset? And um, we're, that's a project we're working on at the moment. And as I mentioned, Development WA is doing some precinct scale sustainability initiatives with batteries with solar and uh, we need to build on that. So there is, there are things happening out there that we can look to, uh, but so much more needs to be done. Um, these are just some thought tasters for you to think through and um, certainly Shelter is um, working with our, our other peak partners to make sure that we embed energy efficiency as businesses as usual in all homes. So that's it Kylie, probably enough from me, thanks. Great, thanks, Michelle. That was great. Uh, and you've all been very timely thus far. So that's <laughs> yeah, you, you cracked the whip. <laughs> I was terrified. <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, I will now pass, oh, sorry, because again, we are a smaller group. If anyone's got questions for Michelle, we can probably just take those now. No? Okay. No problem. So then I will pass over to Chantel. So Chantel um, is going to talk a little bit about opportunities uh, in terms of COVID recovery to solve energy, housing and the climate crisis all at once. Uh, so I'll pass over to you. Hi folks. And um, yeah, it's a great honour to be here today with fantastic peak bodies like Shelter and Wacos. And I'm going to zoom out a little. Um, the work that I do at Clean State is advocating for uh, jobs and climate action in WA and I'm just um, going to let you know who we are because um, some of you might not have heard, um, but we are a relatively new organisation. We're completely independent and we are here to talk about solutions to address climate change in WA in ways that create thousands of jobs and are really exciting for people. We know that um, people aren't motivated by fear when we talk about climate change, even though it is one of the most terrifying things that one could possibly imagine, um, but we're here to talk about solutions and really, really excited um, to be doing this job. So the recent work I've been doing um, has come off the back of the COVID crisis and the recognition that not only do we need a pathway for a zero carbon economy in WA, but also there's never been a more important time in Western Australia to have a plan for jobs that solves a number of crises at the same time. So the three crises that we're facing is of course the COVID crisis where we have 64,000 people out of work um, and a lot of people really hurting in the community. We also have a crisis in the climate where Western Australia is the only state out of all states in Australia with rising emissions. Our emissions increased by 21% in just the last year. Everyone else is going down. Um, and we also have a crisis in our communities, vulnerable communities um, that have been left behind on the back of a massive boom um, and, you know, one of the most prosperous states and places in the world to live. But that we know is not for everybody. And this is just a screenshot of the current waiting list, which actually is more than 14,000 now, almost 14,000 and a half, with people waiting up to two years or more um, for a place uh, to call home. 
So we know that um, the state government has built some public housing, but we are still seeing, we still know that there's just so many, so many uh, families on that waiting list in crisis. Um, so we think that there's an opportunity, there's this once in a generation opportunity that's been brought to us by COVID um, to solve these problems at once and have a really transformative budget and a really transformative approach to COVID recovery. We know that the state government has $5 billion on the table and um, we, our sister organisation, CCWA, uh, got appointed to the expert panel of the COVID response and that got us, um, we were already doing work in the jobs area on a jobs plan, but that actually helped us accelerate our work so that we could present it as part of our work on that panel and to all of the relevant um, ministers, including the Premier, who got a copy of our white paper in his pocket, um, thanks to Piers Verstegen, the direction, Director of uh, Conservation Council. So this is a copy of, this was what I our white paper looks like which is just a kind of very summarized condensed version of our really big jobs plan which I'm going to tell you about in a sec and why I'm telling you about this um, we'll get to in a second is basically we are here to look at um, what are the big ideas right now across 10 sectors of the Western Australian com um, community and economy um, where we could have these transformational initiatives and transformational spending by the government to solve a number of problems at once including climate change and vulnerable communities being left behind um, in a way that is super parochial. So we're very proudly Western Australian. There's no other Western Australian organisation um, or government department uh, putting a plan like this on the table. And so we consulted uh, 90 different experts and stakeholders since uh, in the last uh, four or five months that it's taken to put this together. So really proud of this work and I hope you'll be excited by it because we looked at 10 different sectors here where we could have the most impact and you'll see energy is up there in buildings, which I'm going to talk about in a sec. Um, but yeah, I feel like there's something for everyone and really encourage you to have a look. But we are uh, fundamentally coming from a place of social justice um, and energy justice um, and just to harness those amazing opportunities we've got in WA. What excites me is in the building space, we know that buildings um, are one of the best places to start for construction and the housing industry has really suffered through COVID, but also you have that opportunity for our stimulus spending to be targeted to solve the housing crisis. And so our big, one of our 26 big ideas was you could solve homelessness overnight if you committed to building 15,000 new homes. These would have to be low carbon, um, very energy efficient, essentially wiping out the bills for tenants. And we think you could do that in three years. So our calculations showed that would create heaps of jobs, almost uh, 20,000 jobs a year in the construction sector, solves homelessness. Um, it would save tenants at least $800 a year in bills. Essentially, you're wiping out those massive bills that we're seeing um, people in social housing pay with really low performing homes. And also something really interesting that I found, um, a WA study that found that um, for every person who's experiencing homelessness, if they're safely homed, you're gonna save at least or almost $5,000 per person um, just in healthcare costs every year because of the um, amount of services and emergency attention that they're needing. So that adds up to $72 million a year for our healthcare system. And it also puts government owned land and buildings to work. We just think there's so much potential to do that. Um, so that was our first big idea. And obviously, you know, we, those homes would have solar and be very, very high efficiency. We put um, seven and a half stars as, um, as the minimum, and that would certainly be an improvement. Uh, Michelle reflected on how our construction code is kind of lagging behind. So that would be a massive improvement. Um, it's not just us asking for this, it's just such a no brainer. So here's a couple of grabs from headlines. We saw why the focus of any stimulus should put social housing first. So that was one of our big ideas. And the second one I quickly wanted to share with you um, specifically around energy efficiency, because this is such an exciting um, area to work in. It's considered the, um, a type of energy if you can reduce energy from being used, you don't need to make it in the first instance. And so that's why it's one of the cheapest ways to reduce emissions, really good form of stimulus, because people doing energy efficiency and retrofitting are often small businesses, um, local businesses. And it's also one of the most Im immediate ways to increase the health and well-being and comfort of people living in really poorly performing houses. We know that social housing, um, unfortunately, is... Um, a lot of it is old and aging and not performing well. And so retrofitting for us was just a no brainer. It is such a no brainer. So one of our, another one of our big ideas was to retrofit and repower all of our social housing homes in three years in Western Australia, all of them. 
Now, we know that it can be done. It would create around 4,000 jobs in um, people like this guy, Stephen King, who is an insulation installer and has managed to install 20 social housing insulation um, retrofits or, like as a charity. He's just doing that for free because he just wants to help people. Um, we know that tenants would, again, save a massive amount of money on their bills because the homes are so expensive. So that would be, um, you know, if you net that out across all of those families, you'd save about, or it'd be a stimulus worth about $70 million to local economies. We know inefficient homes are really unhealthy and the Energy Efficiency Council, the national peak body is saying that just a simple insulation package could cut heatwave deaths in Perth by 90%. Uh, so that's incredible for me. And then the other opportunity is we often hear about how costly it is to do this stuff. Um, Michelle mentioned the split incentive. Um, and if we had a price on carbon or if we could have um, some kind of offset credit where we packaged up the insulation and the energy efficiency measures and the carbon savings from doing energy efficiency and retrofits and social housing, that would be worth at $15 a tonne over 30 years, $126 million. So, you know, there's really um, easy ways to make, I, I guess, yeah, opportunities out of something that looks quite grim. And for us, this is just uh, such a, honestly, a no brainer, as I've said before. So that's just a sample of the 26 ideas in our plan. And I just wanted to touch on what next, because we're obviously watching the rollout of the government's stimulus and recovery package. That's why we put a plan on the table. Uh, that's why we're talking to so many people. And we have seen them put out a tiny little scratch of the surface. Um, they've put $6 million towards 500 new solar social homes. And I should just clarify with our retrofit package, we're proposing that every single social housing dwelling would have solar, some would have batteries, they all would have insulation, they all would have um, their gas appliances phased out to electric and have high um, efficient electric appliances. So yeah, they get, it's a very standard basic package. It would cost about four or $5,000 per home, um, nothing in the scheme of things for the benefits that you'd see. So there you go, and they're um, promising 250 new builds. So we think that they could do much better. The community is strongly behind our vision. So 78% um, when we surveyed a thousand people recently on best ways that the government could um, do a stimulus and recovery package, almost the top was um, up the top was um, support social housing and energy efficiency, uh, almost as popular, actually just a little bit more popular than conservation. Um, and we also are seeing great momentum in the media with scientists saying that this is the way to go, that to recover from COVID we need to do, and to solve climate crisis, we need to do these kind of stimulus measures. We're seeing um, business and industry also urging for sustainable recovery packages. We're seeing massive, massive, um, you know, world breaking uh, stimulus packages, green stimulus packages overseas. And um, so, yeah, it's just time to make it happen. And I would really encourage you to have a look at our plan and get in touch to talk more about it. Amazing. Thanks, Chantel. And I really like how Clean States framed it in a very, you know, positive here are some initiatives that we think we could work kind of like. I think that's um, that's really great. And that adds, I think, immeasurably to the kind of dialogue we have about what recovering and recovering from COVID in a social and economic sense looks like. Um, and so we have a Google Doc, which I'm just pasting into the chat. Um, if you're able to click on that and open it up, that would be great. It gives you the two questions that we are looking to answer within this small group conversation that we have next. Just getting a sense of what you're observing or experiencing in terms of energy hardship and climate change vulnerability for the communities that you're working with. And secondly, what reflections and feedback you have on the proposals that Michelle and Chantel have talked about today and the ideas, I suppose, that they've put forward. So I'm just going to pop you into separate rooms now um, and I'll see you back here soon. Community as well, in particular, because um, obviously being a really cold place um, and with a high level of older people it we do it does make a difference yeah absolutely cool thanks leslie and am yeah, excuse me for popping in and out i was uh, listening in as i was driving back to the office i've been on a community luncheon so um i represent community a uh, profit for purpose social enterprise i'm also a lived experience advocate of um, for the homelessness community and um, yes you know anything that we can do uh, as a collective to
to bring down the cost of living for our most vulnerable, then um, you know I, I want to be you know a part of that. So that's great. Thank Thanks, Sam. So, anyone got any reflections on what we on on the content presented? Any places to start, Michelle? Um, so, um, great work, Chantel. Really brilliant paper. We didn't put up our recovery paper, but we've we've got one um, as well. And so, similar to peers, we were at the Premier's Roundtable and the Housing um, Minister and Planning Minister's Roundtable as part of the recovery effort. And it is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, but I, I just wanted to reflect on the launch that Rochelle and I are at this morning. There, there are so many really fantastic grassroots initiatives out there. And the Bill Buddy launch is just amazing. It's been, Bill Buddy um, is a spin off of Climate Clever, which is a really fabulous app that you may have seen as part of the ABC um, Save the Planet series. And so over the next 12 months, there's going to be 300 um, tenants in predominantly social housing testing this app to see how um, a really easy thing on your smartphone can deliver real outcomes in terms of your bills and what you're paying for energy, but also um, reducing carbon emissions. And I think um, people talk about innovation like, oh, it's huge, but it's these quiet intersections where people are just getting on and building on success that is really innovative. And um, I, I think for us, it's a real watch this space because it's the tenant saying, this works for me, this doesn't work for me. And um, it, it's just brilliant. And then coupled with that, the work we're doing with the community housing sector who own the assets to say, you know, how do we get over that split in incentive? What's in it for us in investing in energy efficient things on our properties? We pay for that. How do we recruit the costs? And I think, you know, the sector's up for that conversation and that's where we need... Um, you know, government industry to come to the table and say, you know, the end game is this. How do we support people to have really great um, experiences in their homes by delivering efficiencies at all levels? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Michelle. Anyone else? Has anyone else um, seen any of those sort of, you know, grassroots initiatives or things of people that are just getting on with it? So I think part of it is just sharing some of those stories sometimes, right? And being able to record them. No? <laughs> so Kylie, um, just for us at community, um, what we're really trying to do is make the larger community aware of some of the social issues that are around and some of the challenges that the um, sector have to, um, you know, uh, you know, have those constraints before they can actually bring to fruition some of these initiatives. So, you know, a lot of the time we're having our meetings, and like today, the general community is not here. They're all people from the community sector. So the message sometimes isn't getting a little bit wider uh, into the community. So that's the bridge that we hope to build. And, um, and to continually take these messages out to people who are going about their everyday to day lives, but sort of not sure how they can help, but certainly have an opinion on, um, you know, NIMBY type things, not in my backyard as far as, uh, you know, multi dwellings are concerned. And, and just that re education process where, hey, it's not about a redistribution of social housing all at the um, lower economic level, it's a redistribution of social housing at an affordable level, which could include your children or your grandparents or, or even you in certain circumstances. So that's, you know, what we're trying to do is just say, okay, we've got wonderful grassroots organisations, we've got some massive top-down um, involvement now. Um, how do we engage, you know, the, the community at large? Because they are the ones that are the consumers and they are the ones that, um, that, that drive the spend. You know, the, 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 they, um, they don't have to believe we're in a recession if we don't actually act as if we're in a recession. So, um, yes, just getting those messages to the community. So any help that we can get in that regard or if we can um, be of service in that regard, then please reach out to us. That's great. Thanks, Al. 
I think that's where, um, as a as a community, we we're shifting. We know carbon climate change is real. Um, having a government that has a really solid regulatory environment. So I think um, you know, Rochelle, with her former um, previous history, you know, we've got a, um, a housing um, market that you know price is very important. You know, the cost of development is critical to them. So um, in terms of what's led by industry, in terms of driving more energy efficient product, and then what's kind of required of government because consumers are saying this isn't good enough. It's You've got to have a bit of both. You, you can't regulate to the point that the market collapses, but you can't let cowboys get away with um, building poor product and generally it's people in the lower end of the, the market that can only purchase that poor product, then they're trapped. You know, poverty traps forever. So for us, the regulatory environment is very important. Again, completely inappropriate that WA hasn't adopted the MCC 2019. Um, I've got a meeting at two with the Department of Communities. They are building 500 new social homes. We have a, a, a construction code that is not contemporary in WA. We are acutely worried that they're going to somehow build those homes under the old code just because we've got these transitional provisions. Outcome for tenants, they're paying high bills. It's just, so the regulatory environment's important. So you need that push and pull. And I'd be interested in Rochelle's thought because Rochelle's had this extraordinarily long, fabulous history in the housing industry and um, just has so much to offer. So what are your thoughts, Rochelle, as an industry insider? Oh, understanding um, the housing sector and how it operates. I think you're absolutely right there, Rochelle. We need to get the sector to lead from the front and to find those opportunities where they can to, um, to deliver energy efficiency, energy efficient housing because it's what the market wants and it's because they want to put something good forward. Um, I absolutely agree that we should open up the front. Demonstration projects like we talked to earlier are a really great way to do that at the start but then we need to get a bit more momentum around this, get our consumers actually asking for this really good product um, and then come in underneath with the regulatory environment and push up the bottom just to make sure everybody keeps up that has to be supported though with some education for everybody not just not just the builder not just the guy constructing it not just the designer but the user too because we've got product that people don't understand how to use it and i think for me this is personal view the um the natas construction protocol whilst whilst it moves to improve the performance of the building from a um i guess a theoretical perspective it doesn't think about how people engage with the building. It doesn't think about how a person might understand the design that it's assumed. Um, and so it really, really lacks transparency. And we end up with a six star house that can be used like a two star house, just because people don't understand when they need to open windows to get the breeze through, which windows to open. You know, there's no thought about how that house is going to be used when that design is done. And so it's a little bit, um, you know, it's a very technical tool that doesn't translate well into life for people in their homes and the homes that they live in. It is just an analysis. And I think if we can, um, it, it's aspirational, but to, but to look at a, an assessment for housing that can help people understand the benefit that they can get, if that it articulates into something practical, um, then people will start to appreciate it. If they appreciate it, they'll start asking for it. Once they start asking for it, we start to drive an economy around it and everything kind of picks itself up from there. And so breaking down this whole, what is energy efficiency in a house to something that somebody can relate to and somebody can engage with in a constructive way, I think is the starting point of actually fixing this. That's my view. Kylie, do you mind if I jump in and um, ask Rochelle to explain what her new role is? Because yeah. it's pretty sensational position that you've got Rochelle and people may not know how magnificent this new this role is. And, uh, and relevant to this I guess I work uh, for Energy Policy WA which is the department that looks after uh, the energy settings for the state um, and my role specifically is in consumer advocacy and making sure that the voice of the people broadly are heard in government decision making and so um, I sit at, at the table in here in the office um, doing a lot of the advocacy work that I know your great organisations do but I get to talk to the guy writing the stuff and poke him and, and say hey how about you think about this so um, having come from the outside uh, and knowing how hard it is to get in sometimes and to influence the decision making process um, it feels like Christmas every day so there's um, 
it's a really great opportunity in getting some of these ideas and things and cutting straight through. Um, it doesn't stop with me though, like I'm inside and I've got this little um, rap, you know, rap door entry in on everything, but you still need to make sure that you're presenting these ideas um, into, into the ministers and the various ministers around cabinet and all the different decision making tables to make sure that we're, you know, getting the route kind of you want that, we don't, don't just stop here. Um, so it's a really great, really great little role, but I get a lot of insight into what is being done um, by the government in the energy sector that probably doesn't articulate well out into the community um, and I could, I'm, I'm working, working, beavering away to try and change the way that that's done but I can't obviously make any promises but um, you know this office is responsible for a, a, a transition essentially to move from our current energy practices into the new world of a, a reliable, affordable, sustainable um, and secure energy system for the, for the West. Um, you know, we operate very differently to the East, and so when we look at WA, we've got a really unique isolated system that we need to make sure we keep performing right because we need to make sure we keep the lights on. That's pretty important. Um, and there's an awful lot of work being done, which is about trying to make sure that we can have batteries and we can have um, uh, have renewable energy feed into our grid and one of the one of the big challenges about uh, the system in Western Australia is because it's so isolated like I said we need to make sure that we're using energy at the right times and sourcing energy in uh, in ways that don't overload or underload the grid at any given time. Um, so it's been a little bit of a, a catch point in that sense um, and so um, just dumping lots of dumb solar onto the grid could destabilise it in the long term and so uh, in April this year, the government released what's called the DR Roadmap, that's just, just Distributed Energy Resources Roadmap, which looks at how we can continue to put solar onto our, onto our buildings, how we can continue to add things like batteries and EVs and everything into our system all over the place like they are in our houses, but in a way that is really constructive and really helpful um, to the grid as a whole, and we keep the lights on for everybody and making it more accessible for everybody all through the way. So greening our supply, making it more accessible and, uh, and just helping out everybody in the process. And so that's a, that's a really interesting document for, the, for this group to consider in the sense that it, it looks directly at an action to considering how we can get more tenants to be able to access solar and other alternative uh, green forms of energy rather than just kind of being a receiver. You know, it talks about how we engage in our energy system in two ways. And we've talked today a lot about uh, energy efficiency in our housing and how we can act within our four walls to do things, but we will evolve as a state to using energy in a much, much more dynamic kind of way, how there's energy coming in, where that's come from, who we're getting it from, um, and what its source is. <laughs> We can, you know, we can start to, be, to look at our energy use in that way too. And so uh, as part of the recovery package that the government has announced, um, we've been looking at a couple of different ways to kind of start that evolution. And West Australia is at the forefront of all of this. And we don't, we don't talk about it, like I said, nobody, nobody gets to hear about this exciting stuff that we're doing to completely um, renew our, um, our energy system. Um, you know, you mentioned the 500 social housing properties that look at solar panels on them, but we're also looking at a trial for testing how we can kind of share energy between some different schools, which is a really exciting new way of, of sourcing our, our energy. We're also popping um, 60 bus and train stations are getting solar in there as well. We're looking at different ways of delivering our regional power infrastructure. Obviously Western Australia is a huge, huge state. We need to get power to all these different peoples. And so we're looking at um, uh, community responsive kind of solutions that can help source energy there. And so um, there's an awful lot of positive things that we're doing, uh, I guess, around uh, around the edges. And, you know, uh, things like, like Michelle said, Bill Buddy and that up today, uh, I think are really great complementary steps that, that, that the social sector is taking to help support um, some positive outcomes yeah. in that way. And so um, I engage with uh, a community like yourselves through a couple of different mechanisms. We have a, an advocates forum, which I know a couple of you are, are members of, and we have a, a grants mechanism to help support uh, the consumer voice in the energy sector. And so um, if you are interested in, in getting involved or around that a little bit more, please do 
please do let me know because uh, I just kind of want to be able to pull it all together and coordinate it so that we can feed this in in a really, really constructive and efficient way so we can get the message uh, through to the decision makers in, in the most effective means. Okay, thanks Michelle. Um, and if is it was it was that um, thing you mentioned that people might be interested in, just so I can find it and send it to others who register. I'll pop, I'll pop it in the chat there. Oh, amazing! That'd be great. Thanks. Um, so we've only got a couple of minutes left. Has anyone got any final uh, comments you'd like to make or feedback? Michelle, yeah, go. Well, we do have a state election coming up, so net of all the recovery work, um, I know a number of the peak bodies have been caucusing about um, our state election platform. And um, certainly for us, energy is front and centre in terms of housing and ending housing poverty. So, um, you know, I think you always look at the opportunities. Um, we do know the federal government's been missing in action, so we've, we're really hopeful that as part of the federal budget that they will do something around social housing. And of course, that should include investment in retrofits. And um, our national peak body has got out a proposal for SHARP, a social housing acceleration recovery package where we're looking at retrofits on um, social housing across Australia. So um, take the opportunities when they come, but um, I just want to thank you, Kylie, for setting this up. It's oh, no, been a really no. good discussion and thank Rochelle for um, sharing her new role because it's pretty exciting that government's got you in there now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, there's nothing else. Maybe I will draw us to a close a little bit early. Even though this was a smaller group, I think the content was still really great. And even Ashley mentioned before she dropped off, she was like, oh, the content here is so excellent. It's such a shame that there's a small number of people here. I think people will access the video content, but I just want to thank uh, Graham and Michelle and Chantelle for sharing the content that they did today. Um, and I'm just popped into the, um, yeah, thank you, Chantelle. We've got the Clean State uh, link that Chantelle has dropped in the chat which we'll also send out to everyone but I've just popped a survey monkey link in there too um, because if you have you know five minutes now it'd be so great to just get some feedback on this particular webinar um, you know given there's only a few of us I'd still really like to make sure that your uh, reflections and thoughts are captured um, so thank you so much again Graham Chantel and Michelle um, thanks to all of you for coming and participating um, and have a great rest of the afternoon <laughs>